In 2010, a group of individuals took advantage of a woman by the name of Jennifer Daugherty. Unfortunately, it's a case where people preyed on someone who was more vulnerable and weaker than themselves. Their reasoning for the unfolding events are also despicable and are enough to make your stomach turn. Jennifer trusted these people and they simply decided to kill her. My name's Ben. And I'm Nicole, and you're listening to Wicked and Grim. A true crime podcast. Warning, the following podcast contains graphic content and material intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. return home. Cheers to that. <laughs> so we had a bit of a fun event this week. Our dog, Honey, managed to get out of the yard and she just bolted, gone. gone. And we had to do a great search for her. And uh, three and a half hours later, she just came trotting back. She just decided, yeah, I'll go home. <laughs> just, yeah, why not? We've been yelling, in, you know, in the neighborhood for over three hours, but. I put the steps on that day. I can tell you that. Oh, much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a good exercise day. It was. I was literally actually before she was about to do it or before she left, I was about to go to the gym. I mm-hmm. didn't go to the gym because I was exhausted enough that I was like, yeah, I'm, I think I'm, I'm good actually. So. Well, I had gone to the gym and then I had to come home and do that. <laughs> yeah. So that was real fun because it was also a strength class. So my legs were. Yeah. Tired. <laughs> Something. Well, honey's home. That's yeah, that's all that matters. Definitely. Um, want to know what else that matters? Our, Our Patreon. patrons. Yes. Our patrons. Uh, so we had a few amazing people sign up this week over on Patreon. We had Brendan Watson, Claire Gibbs, and Anne Ott. I think it's Ott or Oot or Out. O-T-T. O-T-T. I'm going to say Ott. Yeah, not Oat. I mean, it depends on the inflection. Oh, maybe it is. Can you imagine yeah. if it is? And then I'm it's just not like, this. Actually, yes, <laughs> it, it could is. Be. Honestly, but thank you. That's so cool to have those people sign up. That's awesome. So they get all the behind the scenes, the extra content, and the um, exclusive episode at the end of each month. They sure do. Which by now, I'm not even sure how many we have. They've, yeah. We've probably got close to 30 exclusive episodes in the library for that now. I would say, yeah. So that's pretty cool to sign up for that, hey? It is. So thank you so much for being a part of that, guys. Mm-hmm. You ready for this episode? Um, Probably not. No, I know. I know a t- teeny tiny bit. Um, the name's a little bit familiar and I know a tiny bit about the case, but it's, I don't know the details and it's going to be, it's going to be bad. It's not a fun one mm-hmm. by any means. It's going to make me angry. I know that for sure. These people certainly took advantage of this person and it, it's heartbreaking to say the least. Mm-hmm. So. Without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? Okay, let's do it. So Jennifer Daugherty was a 30-year-old woman from Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania. She was a kind and trusting person who possessed a childlike innocence due to her mental disability. Her trusting nature endeared her to many. Her mother, Denise Murphy, even said this about her daughter, Jennifer. Quote, she liked to have fun. She was trusting, she made friends easily, she loved to dance, and she loved to sing. Jennifer was truly a kind and innocent soul. With her disability, she had the equivalent, like mind, of about a 13-year-old. Okay. Okay. So recently, Jennifer had excitingly shared with her family about her new friends that she had made. Friends that had lived in Greensburg, which was in the neighboring town. Despite Jennifer's limitations, she independently traveled by bus to Mount Pleasant, from Mount Pleasant, sorry, to Greenberg. This was a frequent thing that was was only approximately 10 miles away. She did this for various appointments. It was there that she'd found companionship and her new friends at the community center. The friendship grew over a little while, and it would be on February 10th, 2010, that she informed her mother and stepfather of her plans for a sleepover at her friend's apartment in Greensburg. So for a minute, I want to I want to put you guys in this perspective here. Imagine because Jennifer is the like mind of a 13 year old. Mm -hmm. So put yourselves in the shoes when you were 13 and you were uh, having a sleepover with a friend. Remember how much excitement you had in those those years, Mm -hmm. how much fun, how 
innocent you were, yeah. the goofy, the weird, the the stuff you got up to. Well, yeah, you would be doing some like eating some yummy food, watching some movies, having a pillow fight, you know? Yeah. And I mean, nine it, yards, whatever the case. I mean, in 2010, there's a little bit more Internet at the time. I'm sure maybe it's going to be watching YouTube or who knows what. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's that's what Jennifer is is getting ready for. She's excited to have a sleepover with her friends. And that in itself is so innocent and adorable to say the least which of course that innocence was stripped away she was going there with the intention of attend attending a doctor's appointment in greensburg and the next or sorry the next morning returning home okay. so she's going there to spend the night with friends yeah go to a doctor's appointment and come home so it was a bit of time out on her own with with friends doing their thing now this is exactly the type of independence that jennifer's mother sought in her daughter. She had a disability that held her back. However, that didn't mean it would prevent a normal and fruitful life for Jennifer. So she encouraged things like this. Of course, go out, go to your appointment on your own. You can take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Just because you have a disability doesn't mean you can't take care of yourself, right? Independence is still important. Yeah, that sounds like an awesome mom. 100%. Mm -hmm. So on the morning that she left to Greensburg, Jennifer left a note with her friend's contact details on it and expressing her loves and her love and well wishes for her mother. And that note said this, quote, Mom, I hope that you will have a good day at work. And I also love you very much. I will talk to you sometime later. Her stepfather, Bobby Murphy, dropped her off at the bus station, just as he had always did whenever she was traveling by herself. They exchanged a kiss in the cheek as they said their goodbyes. And this would be the last time he would ever see Jennifer alive. Oh, my chest is already getting tight. This shit's going to just break my heart. Right? Like I said, the innocence in this woman. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. From there, it would be on February 11th, 2010, when Jennifer's lifeless body was discovered concealed in a garbage and in a school parking lot. Holy shit. You just got right into it there. I did. Her remains showed that she had endured prolonged torture before succumbing to a fatal stabbing. Oh, my gosh. An investigation into the gruesome is a light way of putting it, but that's what it was. A very gruesome discovery quickly uncovered the truth when looking into the last place she was known to be. Her friends. <laughs> or the people that she called friends. Yeah, friends in quotation marks. Yeah. So the Westmoreland County coroner, Kenneth Baca, confirmed the grim discovery as they revealed that the victim's belongings were recovered in the building's attic. So the apartment where the friends lived, her belongings were recovered in the attic. In the attic. Okay. So they're trying to stash them somewhere. Totally. Yeah. And they were found. So like this went down relatively fast, discovering who did this to Jennifer. They went to the apartment and it was pretty much instant as far as i can tell i tried to dive into really how the investigation got started and it seemed like it was just they just knew it was like oh these are the people mm -hmm. and it, they just found stuff like immediately yeah it's almost interesting that they would find her remains so quickly when they were in the attic really I well no it. her remains weren't in the attic her her belongings Oh, her belongings. Yes. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Her belongings that were recovered sense. in the attic. Her remains were found in the garbage outside okay. of the school. So then, yeah. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. Um, they also found in the attic, along with her belongings, um, some some items that were used in, in cleanup. So okay. either it was rags or bleach or wow. whatever. Now, Jennifer's sister, Joy Burkholder, expressed this. Quote, she was exploited. And her kindness and her handicap made her very vulnerable. She trusted everybody. She believed everyone was good and no one would hurt her. Denise, Jennifer's mother, reflected on the situation with immense regret. And to quote her, my biggest regret was forcing Jennifer to act as an adult. Oh, no. To which I want to say she should not... I understand like people are going to have regret, but she should not feel any sort of remorse for encouraging her child into adulthood. I know. It's what a parent is supposed to do. It's supposed to protect them. Uh, 
and just get them ready for the world, Mm -hmm. prepare them for what's out there. And it's so unfortunate that there's some predators to take advantage and seek and destroy. No one can predict a situation like this. Well, the fact that the mom has regret is just freaking heartbreaking, but it's like, I don't know. You can't live your life preparing someone for something like this happening. No, you can't. Because then that just would take literally like all the joy out of everything forever. It would. And she had very good intent in actually putting Jennifer into an adulthood, giving her independence and taking the bus and going to Mm -hmm. her own appointments and everything. There is so much good in giving someone their independence, especially when they're in the shoes of Jennifer. Yeah. Who... Rather than being shielded from the world, it's like you can still be a part of the world because just because you're different doesn't mean that you you can't thrive. Yeah. And if only we didn't like there wasn't people that just Mm -hmm. were monsters out there. So Jennifer had made her way to Peggy Darlene Miller's house, her friend, at 428 North Pennsylvania Avenue apartment. And this is where several others whom she considered friends, were gathered. With the likes of Robert Lauren Masters Jr., Ricky Smearns, Melvin Knight, Amber Meadinger, and Angela Marnusi. Holy shit, there's a lot of them. There's six of them. Six of them that just decide to make poor-ass decisions. Well, we're going to get into their poor-ass decisions, but yes. Okay, wow, I thought maybe there'd be like two or three, maybe, max. Yeah, but... That actually Not makes me more mad, but okay. Right? Now, Angela in particular had known Jennifer for years, and the two often conversed on the phone. However, upon Jennifer's arrival at the apartment, the situation took a horrific turn. Now, I'm aware we kind of touched on a bit of Jennifer leaving and how this all started, and we quickly went to her body being discovered. Mm-hmm. And now we're diving into where she's at with the friends. But we're again going to take another turn because I think it's really important to actually tell this in a linear fashion. And one of the things that I think is very crucial to examine is the individuals that were capable of perpetuating this sort of crime. Um, Perpetrating is the word I was looking for, sorry. um, Against someone like Jennifer. So before we get into the actual crime, these are those six individuals. Here we go. Melvin Knight was one of them uh, and later emerged as the, quote, ringleader. Among the group Uh, at 20 years old, Melvin had a troubled past and a criminal record. He was born to a drug addicted father who was incarcerated during his formative years. And Melvin's life was rough from a very young age. He endured a traumatic incident at the age of five when he fell from a moving vehicle, resulting in lifelong learning and social challenges. Amber Meetinger, also 20 at the time, had her own tumultuous upbringing Jennifer had begun to trust Amber at some point in their shared experience at West Place, which was a center for individuals with special needs. The path of Amber and Melvin converged at a homeless shelter in Washington in January of 2010, and Amber had become pregnant with Melvin's child. Together, the two crossed paths with Ricky Smearns, another key player in this tragedy. Ricky was 24 at the time, had a history of criminal behavior and deeply troubled background, born to a substance addicted sex worker from Philadelphia and a Pittsburgh gang member. Ricky's childhood saw the likes of foster care, abuse and neglect. As a result, he had a litany of traumas and mental health struggles. Angela Marnusi was just 17 at the time of the crime. She too faced her own challenges. She sustained head injury in the truck ac- in a truck accident two years prior at the age of 15. The injury significantly altered her behavior, contributing to her involvement in the tragic events. Peggy Miller, age 27, carried a history of mental health issues. And Robert Masters, the sixth individual implicated in Jennifer's murder, was 36 at the time and had a criminal record of his own. So these six were the so-called friends of Jennifer, and together they murdered her in cold blood. Hmm. So I do understand each and every one of these individuals has their own troubles, their Mm -hmm. own struggles. Yeah, Um, that's why it's hard to even kind of comment on there because it it sounds like a lot of them, you know, had kind of tough situations, right? Well, my perspective 
is everyone has tough situations, some greater than others. Mm -hmm. And these are definitely great, tough situations. I have not experienced some of the things that these people have gone through. Um, but it doesn't matter what you go through. It's what you do as a result. Mm -hmm. Just because you were, you had wrong done to you doesn't mean you can go do wrong to yeah, someone else. Yeah, it's no excuse. As soon as you do wrong on your own free will, it's it's on your own accord. Mm -hmm. Now, there are situations where mental health may not be your own free will. You know what I mean? That's true. But in this yep. case, it certainly was their own free will. Well, yeah. And especially when there's six individuals, you think someone in that group, um, you know, can step up and decide that this is wrong. Like we shouldn't be doing this. This is the wrong decision. I agree. And we'll touch on that at some point. Okay. So what exactly happened went as follows. It began when Jennifer had arrived at the apartment and went to take a shower. Now, the, when she was in the shower, the friends, if you will, pilfered through Jennifer's purse and stole a gift card and $8 worth of money, money that she had intended to use for her bus fare the next day to her appointment and then home. Okay, that's really sad. But also, it's very interesting that she just shows up there and, like, has a shower. Well, I mean, she's staying the night. She's having a sleepover, right? I Maybe guess. she showers before bed. Yeah, true, true. All right, all right. I'm, I was almost thinking maybe they were like, yeah, you should go have a shower or something. They might have. I'm, I'm, I'm unclear how that exactly started, but yeah. for whatever reason, she went and had a shower. Okay. Uh, so when, where am I here? Sorry. Gotcha. So they pilfered through her purse, took a gift card, took $8, and then they actually went in and spilled a bunch of makeup, whether it's her makeup or some other makeup they had, but they spilled a bunch of makeup and mouthwash inside her purse as well, making a big mess of it when they were all done. Needless, but that's what they did. Okay. That makes no sense, but I mean, none of this does, but okay. No, none of, trust me, none of it does. When Jennifer came out of the shower and found out what happened, she asked them why they would do that to her. Mm -hmm. To which, as far as I could tell, she never really got a response. Instead, the events just simply began to escalate. Robert, according to his later testimony, uh, assisted Jennifer in retrieving her clothes after Melvin and Ricky, Ricky stripped her and tossed her clothes out a window. However, before she could dress and leave, the situation, again, escalated. She was then beginning to get viciously attacked. She was assaulted and endured punches to her head. And over the next 36 hours, agonizing hours, Jennifer was subjected to relentless beatings, not only with being punched or kicked, but with various objects, including soda cans and a vacuum cleaner. Amber and Angela would later confess to taking turns to violently beating her with a metal towel rack and crutches. Holy shit. They are pulling absolutely no punches. They are reveling in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They are taking turns beating her with a metal towel rack and crutches. Well, see, and that's the other thing, too. The whole 36 hours that you just said. It, I am sorry, but like hours. at what fucking point would you decide that that's enough? Right. Like I like, you know, you make a decision. It's already a terrible decision. There's six of you making this decision and then it actually goes on for that long. Yeah. And you're continuing to make this bullshit decision. But continuing. Yes. And escalating it. Taking turns. So you're letting one do the act while you stand back and watch and revel in it. I want to emphasize that word that I've already used. I think that's the second time now reveled in watching this unfold. And you're doing this to someone who literally was so excited to come and hang out with you and is the sweetest kind of soul. Yeah. <laughs> who just wanted to have a sleepover with their friends. Oh my gosh. That is a, that's just enough to make you want to just sob. Yeah. Wow. But instead, Jennifer was being put through hell uh, and was the subject to more than just blunt force trauma. She was forced to drink and swallow detergent, urine, cooking oil, medications, spices, and nail polish. Her abusers, her, sorry, her abusers then bound her with strings of Christmas lights and began to shave her head and paint her face with the nail polish. 
Tragically, Jennifer was also sexually assaulted by Melvin as well. Oh, my goodness. Okay. I was like hoping that that would not also be a piece of it, but okay. It It was. Was, unfortunately. Eventually, at one point, they began to tire, if you will, of the torture. And the, the group got together and voted to kill her. So all six of them decided, hey, you know, I'm, I'm bored. I'm done with uh-huh. this. Let's just kill her now. Let's just deal with this and get it over with because I want to move on to God knows what. Spend her gift card and $8 on something, I guess. Holy like, how fucked up is shit. that? That is beyond messed. Yeah. So they then, after deciding this, untied Jennifer from the Christmas lights. And they forced her to write a suicide note which they intended to place in her back pocket to stage her death. The note that she was forced to write reads as follows. I haven't been very happy for a while. And I also feel like that everybody who would be better without me on the earth. I will always love my mom and stepdad, no matter what. And I will always love the rest of my family also. My nieces and nephew will be lucky to have a better aunt than me. I am done with life. Goodbye, Jennifer. Oh my gosh. Brutal, brutal, brutal. Yes. Oh. That's the note they forced her to write. You know, that is terrible. I also am very much so struggling the fact that they use Christmas lights to um to tie her up. That is that is not sitting well. No. I can't stop thinking about them forcing her to write this note though because i i guarantee you let's let's take this one line here my nieces and nephews would be lucky to have a better aunt than me i guarantee you she has nothing but extreme love for her nieces oh my gosh her nieces and nephews probably freaking adore her so them making her write this six people surrounding you forcing you to write this I guarantee you it put doubt in her mind and she probably believed that by the time she was done writing because of these sick fucks. Oh my gosh, Ben. I know. I never even thought of that, but you're absolutely right, I'm sure. They probably made her write this and made her fucking believe it too. Which makes my stomach fucking turn. Yeah, yeah. Once they had the note written, they once again tied her up using the Christmas lights again. Ricky then handed Melvin a steak knife and he proceeded to brutally stab Jennifer in the chest, hitting her in the heart and the lungs. Despite these grievous injuries, though, Jennifer did not die. And Melvin yelled, quote, this bitch still ain't dead. Holy fuck. Ricky then took the knife and slashed Jennifer's wrist. Yet still... In her dire state, Jennifer clung to life, and the men then resorted to choking her by pulling two ends of the Christmas lights looped around her neck, ultimately taking her life. Okay. That was like, that was some serious bullshit. Yeah. I cannot believe that they, um, Oh, I can't, I, I, I can't even speak right now because the torture that that would have been like trying the pain and the suffering that they, by like prolonging the killing is wow. Wow. Every single thing they did Mm. was done with extreme malicious intent. Yeah. Every single thing. Like stabbing her freaking heart and her lungs. Yep. And then her freaking wrists cutting them. Yep. And then, but also just like the will of her, of her to live. I know. Jennifer's body was then stuffed into a garbage can and discarded in the parking lot of Greensburg Salem Middle School, which is where she would later be found. As for the trial, Amber, Peggy, and Robert each pleaded guilty to the murder, offering detailed testimonies about the events. Oh, so at at one point they decided, like, let's not be continuing being pieces of shit. Yeah. So they they did, well, they pleaded guilty, so I'm assuming they probably made some sort of plea deal. But we'll we'll, we'll get into their sentencing And they decided that they would, you know, take ownership for a sense. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, so they actually even offered a bit of a motive on how it began to and recounted how Angela was harboring some jealousy of Jennifer because of a perceived potential relationship with Ricky. Cause apparently Jennifer and Ricky had in her eyes flirted a bit. Hmm. That's, that's the motive. Yes. And Ricky was Angela's boyfriend. Okay. So allegedly it was Angela who enticed Jennifer to the apartment and then Ricky initiated the assault. So this mm. all occurred because Angela thought Jennifer flirted with Ricky a bit. And honestly, Jennifer was probably just being nice. Jennifer was just talking to a friend. Yeah. Being nice and like showing enthusiasm probably and excitement for having yeah. these new friends and exactly liking life. Yep. I know. So while police had not directly implicated Peggy and Robert in the physical abuse and murder, evidence presented during the trial suggested their involvement in the group's, quote, family meeting where the decision to end Jennifer's life was made. So they called that when they convened all six of them to discuss, okay, I'm bored. Let's kill her now. A quote, mm -hmm. family meeting. That's some family meeting. Yeah. That ain't no family that no. I would ever want to be part of. Fuck no. Um, now, at one point, the two were even left alone with Jennifer. So Peggy and Robert, mm -hmm. they were left alone with Jennifer while the others were temporarily out of the apartment. In this time, Jennifer was begging and pleading for them to help her and let her go. You said at some point you think that they would think maybe let's do let's someone. do something stop yes yeah, someone you feel like would have that thought instead of helping they chose to notify the rest of the group about jennifer asking for help and wanting to escape wow so they did the exact opposite totally the exact opposite now their lawyers sought to argue that these two acted out of fear of their own lives believing they too were would face harm if they resisted the group's actions so during during their sentencing hearings, both Peggy and Robert made tearful pleas for leniency, expressing remorse for their roles in the tragedy. A quote from Robert in the courtroom goes as such. I was scared for my life. I should have done something, but I didn't because I was scared. Can the family forgive me? Hmm. That I just have to say that is a bit hard to swallow, though, because the gang mentality sort of right. It yeah. is it is sometimes hard. You see these situations where it is hard to step outside of the group and do something different. Definitely. However, the group is no longer there. The group is out of the apartment. Yeah. It's Robert, Peggy, and Jennifer in the apartment. So they- And they did nothing. They could have quite easily have- They could have called the cops. Yeah. But they didn't. Yeah. They could have easily untied her and ran with her, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. That's true. A quote from Peggy in the courtroom goes as such. I am sorry, and I am guilty. She was my friend, and I should not have voted for her to die. You know what? This What's her fucking name, Peggy? Yep. Peggy, like, you can't say she was your friend now. Like, just no. shut the fuck up. No, it's, she was not your friend. Yeah, like, that is making me mad. You may have been her friend, but you are not. No. Like, like in Jennifer's eyes, you are her friend. But yeah. you were not her fucking no, friend. You were about as far opposite of that as you can get. Yeah. You you did nothing but take advantage and trick Jennifer in every way, shape, or form. And then you fucking killed her. Yeah. Like I mean, I get it's good, it's good if p criminals or whatever have remorse, but it's also just kind of like fucking shut the fuck up because it is far too late for you yeah. to all of a sudden decide that you have like the tiniest sliver of maybe a heart. Yeah. She probably wouldn't have felt guilty and she probably wouldn't have thought I should have not voted for her to die if she wasn't caught. True. Very true. It always comes after being caught mm -hmm. because yeah. that's when the remorse sets in. I was caught. I'm sorry. Yeah. I they would have just gone and lived their life. She would have. Jennifer's family responded with their statements uh, a heartfelt plea uh, to the judge for harsher sentences. Um, one of those statements from her sister comes in and says this, you had my sister as a friend. She loved Miller and valued her. You didn't value her. You probably value a hairbrush more than you value her. Oh, 
Ooh, I mean, that's real harsh, but real true. Yeah. Angela was convicted of first degree murder and received a life sentence in prison. Melvin and Ricky faced the harshest penalties. Melvin and Ricky were the ones who actually stabbed and killed her, Mm -hmm. receiving death sentences for their roles in the crime. Oh, wow. Amber, having pleaded guilty, was sentenced to 40 to 80 years behind bars. Peggy and Robert, also pleading guilty, received sentences of 30 to 70 years and 35 to 74 years. Okay, good, good. Now, I want to end this episode with one of the most honest and true quotes I think I've ever come across in the likes of true crime podcast researching. I understand closure. I understand what it means to a lot of people. But when you are missing a loved one due to the chosen actions of someone else, closure can only go so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. So outside the courtroom, Bobby, Jennifer's stepfather, said this. Closure is Jennifer coming back to us. And Jennifer won't come back to us. So there is no closure. Oh, boy. Yeah. I mean, that is a statement that is very true. Yeah. It's so simple, but like so true. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And that's the story of Jennifer Daugherty. That is a ridiculously awful story. It breaks my fucking heart so much. Well, yeah, it's just, I mean, most of the stuff we talk on here is beyond unnecessary, but that is just new level. It is. Because she seemed like she just was like this light. She was. How you, how you described her. She loved to dance and sing and she was just going to go have a sleepover with her friends. <laughs> And she's she's taking independence upon herself and taking the bus to go to an appointment on her own. Yeah. Despite the challenges she has. That's exactly what she was. She was a fucking light. No kidding. And they snuffed that light out without a second fucking thought. And like the world we live in just needs so much more like that. They do. It does. It's just it's like a bull. It's it's hard. Our like our world is a bit rough sometimes. And it's I mean, it's there's a lot of good, but there's a lot of bad. And it's interesting just people and and how they can make decisions like that. And for 36 hours, not at one point. They question it. What the fuck am I doing? Right. 36 hours is a long time. Yeah. A long time for Jennifer to suffer and a long time for you to sit there watching her and not think for one moment, like you said, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, that is so long. Because I'm just thinking like this is by nowhere, no comparison whatsoever. But like just how long Honey was gone, like three and a half hours, right? Like we mentioned at the beginning, seemed like an eternity. And so I couldn't imagine doing something so heinous for 36 hours. Right. I mean, at some, like, this is a really weird analogy and I'm really sorry saying it in advance. If I'm on the toilet pooping and I'm sitting there for like five minutes longer on my phone after I'm done, I'm like, what what am I doing? I should probably get off the can and put my phone down. You know, like I've been Mm -hmm. pooping for a while. Like my legs are starting to go numb. Like maybe I'll stand up. At some point you think something would kick in that mob mentality you would think an individualism idea, an individualistic idea would hit your fucking mind at some point. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you it did with each and every one of those people, but they made the conscious fucking decision to ignore it. They did. They absolutely guarantee. Did. Wow. I mean, it's good that it was um, like, I feel like the sentencing was good. Yes, it was. It was long sentences and it was, you know, you did do something wrong here and you're going to face the consequences, which is not always the case. So that is good. Yeah. But I also like, why the fuck do guys always sit on the toilet for so long with their phone? (laughs) It's it's a moment when you're not going to ever be disturbed by anything. No one's going to just say, for example, hey, Ben, can you feed the dogs for me real quick? I like. There's nothing wrong with that, but if I'm sitting on the can, you're not about to interrupt me no matter what I'm doing. 
I, I no. do interrupt you more now because we do only have one bathroom. <laughs> Too, but touche. I do have to say, like, is that a guy thing? Because I I'm not sure if that if like a lot of females do that. I'm just curious. Anyway, I'm just thought. I don't. I don't, I don't know if it's a guy thing per se, but I I don't know. I don't it's, know. it's not like I do it extreme. It's like I probably spend at times an extra five minutes. Cool. But it's just five minutes of bliss. <sighs> no, I don't think that is. I'd way rather spend five minutes doing something else. It's just five minutes of solitude. That's all it is. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for bringing that case to our attention. It's one that I deserved mean, attention. It does. And it's, it's, it's like, I don't know how to say this, but it's a damn shame. Like it is a damn shame that that happened. If someone, if you guys are listening right now, if someone that you know is just trying to be nice in one way, shape or form, just try and be nice back. Mm -hmm. Cause that's all, all it is. I, I just see Jennifer is just someone who's just happy and just trying to be nice and just trying to have fun and just trying to live life. And if we could just be nicer to people like that, then maybe we could be a little bit more like Jennifer. Totally. I mean, what is the, like an act of kindness spread? Like what is, there's a saying, I, I'm not going to be able to think of it off the top of my head, but like if you spread kindness, it can go pretty Oh, it's contagious. Far. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was the story of Jennifer Daugherty. Like I said, I really thought it uh, deserved some attention. Her story is uh, one that rattled me during research quite a bit. Okay, well, I have just one tiny idea. I feel like in Jennifer's honor, anyone that listens to this can make one conscious effort to do an act of good kindness after listening to this episode would be amazing. Deal. Let's do that. I think that would be unbelievable. 100%. Yeah. Maybe we could make this world just a little bit better, just in Jennifer's name. Totally. Okay. Let's do it. Well, uh, with that, to Jennifer and uh, to you guys out there. Stay wicked. Mm -hmm.